Rachel, it's great to be with you. And I, it's even worse than you than you mentioned uh, today. Today was a procedural vote to begin debate on the voting rights bill, which got no Republican votes. It wasn't a vote on the bill. They didn't even want to talk about the bill. And I think that really, really makes a difference. And and uh, it, it's a uh, it, it was it was uh, I, I guess you shouldn't say shocking. It wasn't really surprising. I didn't expect to get those Republican votes. But to have them just simply say, we just don't want to have any part of voting rights. Uh, what a turnaround. And I think it was 2006, the Voting Rights Act was uh, reinvigorated or, or uh, re-voted by something like 96 to nothing. Well, that's not going to happen today. It was in March of this year, Senator, you wrote an op-ed for The Washington Post that had it as, as its title, What Happens to the Filibuster Depends on Republicans, How Republicans Play Their Hand, meaning depending on if they allow for, you know, common sense voting rights bills to pass, if they worked in good faith to find compromise on other issues, then there was no reason, there'd be no reason to get rid of the filibuster or to carve it out on, right. on specific issues. That, it's seven months down the road now. Um, how do you feel Republicans have played their hand? Well, th th we've, we have had some bipartisan bills, but it wasn't due to the leadership. It was a group of sort of a rump group from both sides that negotiated the major infrastructure bill, for example, that got 69 votes. I mean, that was a major accomplishment. But today is an indication. And, and what really bothers me, Rachel, is quite often you'll have these votes, uh, you know, procedural votes, slowing things down. And then you have negotiations. It happened on the CARES Act. The, the Democrats blocked the consideration of the CARES Act. But then there was two or three weeks of negotiations. We ended up with a really good bill that passed unanimously. What's happening now, though, is there seems to be no forthcoming discussion from the Republicans, no interest in any part of the bill that we voted on today, which, as you point out, was a compromise bill worked out by Joe Manchin, a former secretary of state, a guy who really believes in voting rights. But they're not coming back with any any further discussion. The filibuster and Joe's theory of the filibuster is it forces bipartisanship. It forces the parties to, to work together. That theory only works if, if both of the parties are willing to meet at the table. If one of them just uses it as sheer unadulterated obstruction, which is what happened today, then, you know, that's when, as I as you pointed out, I say, you know, the democracy has to trump a rule. Uh, you know, this 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 is not in not in the, the filibuster, not in the Constitution. We need to restore the Senate to what it was back, you know, when Lawrence worked there and when I worked there 40 years ago. Hmm. The filibuster was very rarely used. Now we have we have to have cloture votes on deputy secretaries of, of defense. I mean, everything requires either a, 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 a cloture vote uh, for nominees or 60 votes for anything substantive. That's not what the framers intended. They didn't intend a supermajority in the Senate, and here we are. Let me, let me give you one piece of math, Rachel, that I think you'll find surprising. You can get 41 votes out of the current Senate, which was enough to block any legislation. And if you take the states that those 41 senators represent, add all the population together, you get 24% of the American people. So the situation we're in now is that 24 percent of the American people have a, an effective veto over anything that 76 percent of the American people think is important public policy. I don't think that squares with democratic theory. Senator King, when you talk with your colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle, and I'm thinking about Senator Sinema and Senator Manchin um, and others who have been reluctant to allow for any other any other new change to the filibuster rule for uh, uh, even on issues like this are are they open to persuasion on this issue I, I i wanted to talk to you tonight in part because of your credibility on this issue because you have not been somebody who's been willing to throw out this rule and who's wanted to change the rules from day one you're a reluctant convert on this issue and i just wonder if if that helps you persuade your other colleagues who are sort of coming from the same position on you who maybe haven't haven't come as far as you have well, I have had some of those discussions. And by the way, being reluctant on this issue is not irrational. The, the reason for my reluctance is uh, is that what's, uh, you know, this is a double-edged sword. What we now view as obnoxious obstruction 
two years or four years or six years from now, when the shoe is on the other foot, when the Republicans have the majority, we might view as a precious shield to project, to protect important environmental laws or you name it, whatever it is, the, the ACA, for example. So, uh, you know, this is this is a hard call because once it goes, it goes. But I think that uh, Joe and Kirsten are, might be open to not abolishing the rule, but to change it and to change it in such a way that it forces debate, it allows debate. That's the whole idea. It's supposed to be unlimited debate, not a tool of simple obstruction. So I think we're going to be searching. Jeff Merkley of Oregon has done a huge amount of work in studying the, you know, the details, how to do it. Norm Ornstein, for example, I think you know Norm, he has a suggestion that says instead of the proponents having to get 60, the opponents would have to muster 40 or 41. And they'd have to have their people on the floor. Right now, if you're against a bill, you don't even have to show up because the proponents have to get to 60. So there are lots of interesting opportunities. The talking filibuster, let's make people go to the floor and hold the floor. Uh, you know, most people think of the filibuster as, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Jimmy Stewart's talking all night and that kind of thing. That never happens. A filibuster now is too damn easy. You pick up the phone and call the majority leader and say, I filibuster this bill. That's it. 60 votes. You don't have to hold the floor. You don't have to do anything. So I think there is space for changes in the rule that would allow some protection to the minority, but wouldn't allow the minority to effectively have a veto over important legislation, particularly in this area. If this were a simple policy question on some uh, issue or another, I'm not sure I'd be where I am. But when it comes to democracy itself, and that's what's at risk, Rachel, I've never been so worried about the future of my country because we're headed for a place where if people don't trust elections, what is that? Where does that leave us? And we hmm. saw on January 6th, those people felt violence was their only option. And uh, I, I don't I don't want to go there. And and uh, so uh, that's why I think this is so important. So we've got to find I'm not if, if we do a carve out, you know, Mitch McConnell will then say, well, we're going to do a carve out in two years for the right to life or something that we consider very important. Uh, and by the way, it's possible that Mitch McConnell is licking his chops about this. He's he hopes that the Democrats will will get rid of the filibuster. And then it's Katie bar the door for him when he's in the majority at some point in the future. So this is not an easy call. I want you to realize that that, that, that there's a there are a lot of really important issues that we're going to have to face in making this decision. But the bottom line is we got to protect the country. We've got to protect democracy. We can't let this uh, wave of voter suppression and the, the changing of the rules that you mentioned uh, happen. Uh, you know, we're, 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 this is fragile and we're at a really dangerous moment. This is the most dangerous moment, I think, since 1860 in terms of the, the, the future of the country. Senator Angus King, independent of Maine. Senator King, thank you so much for your time tonight. As I said, I know it's been a, a long day, a long couple of days already. Thanks for being here with us tonight. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Great to be with you. All right. We've got much, 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 much more ahead tonight. Stay with us.